I want to welcome to the program a, a very interesting United States Senate candidate with an absolutely terrific story. Uh, she's running in the great state of Washington, Tiffany Smiley. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. So happy to be on. Yeah, listen, um, you guys, uh, typically Washington State in recent years has not been a state that we've looked at for anything statewide, right? It's, it's, been, it's been really tough. As a backstory, the only campaign that I've ever been a part of that lost was in Washington State. <laughs> Uh, in 2004, oh, no, don't tell me this. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a feeling that you are capturing an energy that uh, we never could back in 2004, and it's certainly a different environment. You are absolutely right. And, and what's exciting is, that, you know, from the very beginning of this, I've been at this for a year, it's been about the people, and I wanted to get out and listen to as many. Washingtonians as I could. So when we say our grassroots movement is real, it is real. Um, they, people are fired up and there is an energy here. And you can you can tell just by the amount of volunteers who are signed up to my campaign and the amount of money that we've been able to raise as a political outsider, as a first time candidate, that people are really energized and ready for change here in Washington state. That's what I think is so interesting about you is that your first time in politics, you're taking a shot at the title here with Patty Murray who is, I mean, listen, she's the worst of the worst in so many regards, but your background, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got interested in politics and sort of what is, has given you uh, this opportunity. Yeah, well, first I have to say, you know, 17 years ago, if someone would have told me, or even, you know, back in kindergarten, Garden. If someone would have said, Tiffany, someday your life is going to lead to politics. I would have laughed. <laughs> you know, you're crazy. There's, there's no way my life would lead into politics. Um, I grew up in a very, very small town, El Topio, Washington, um, on a farm. We didn't have much, but what I had was a ton of experiences. Um, growing up on the farm, you know, we're sort of like free range kids. We had horses. We raised, I raised steers, um, hogs. We had all kinds of animals and, you know, on any given day, you just go outside, you'd hop on your horse bareback and go riding in the field. And, um, you know, snow days, we cousins would come over, we cruise all over, you know, all over the property. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because some of these experiences, I was about five or six and we were out in the, in the snow playing, you know, my mom would just let us go out. We always tease her like, mom, you must've locked us out because we have all these crazy experiences, you know? Um, and I, I fell in a well, um, at six years old and my cousins and my brother built a human chain, um, and pulled me out. You're so like, these, me. these are sort of the, <laughs> No, true story. The, these are the life experiences that I grew up with. Um, and, you know, I, I always wanted to be a doctor or a nurse. I, I wanted to help people. Um, so there was no question what I would do, you know, when when college came. Um, I, I I met Scotty Smiley, my, my high school sweetheart, when I was bused into the city school. So I was bused in in junior high to the city school and uh, met Scotty was Smiley. There was, no, was, that, was that because there was no school where you grew up or was that just like by choice you had to, to go to the city school? Yeah, I mean, it, that was the only middle school that. You yeah, know, right. OK, uh, yeah, that was the only middle school in our area. We had a small little tiny elementary school that we would go to the country kids would go to. Um, and then in middle school, we had to, you know, bus into the big, bigger school. And um, that's where I met Scotty Smiley. And I tell my three boys today, I, I say, you better be the nicest boys in junior high, because it was really a shocker for a small town country girl <laughs> to get busted. And everyone was so mean and sixth grade was so awful, but there was one person who was super nice. And it was Scotty Smiley, um, who ended up becoming my husband. Uh, but we were just friends in junior high and, um, you know, played sports. I started getting into sports and, um, you know, really sports propelled sort of like my, my ambition and my drive. I loved being a part of teams. Um, I, you know, I loved uh, winning, losing all of it, you know, learning how to work together well with others. And um, so when I graduated, Scotty, went on to the United States Military Academy and I, I went into nursing school. There was no question what I was going to do with my life. So that was sort of the path I, I took. And it's funny because, you know, growing up, 
I rodeoed, I, I would, you know, do barrel racing and pole bending. And my dad always said, you know, I'll take you to ranch and home, which was this local, you know, you could get anything from the ranch to the home. And uh, he said, I'll take you there. I'll buy you any boots you want. But I, I was more, more involved in sports and, and kind, kind of going down that path, um, which, you know, I'm super grateful for those experiences. Yeah, totally. So your husband, Scotty, goes off to the military. And this is where your, your story gets incredibly interesting because you face challenges soon thereafter. Yes. You know, our life, it, it totally turned. Um, it, it actually blew up into a million pieces. In some ways, I, you know, na- the farm girl got off the farm and I naively thought, you know, that I was really living and had achieved um, the American dream. I, I was a nurse, had my bachelor's in science in nursing. I had married Scotty Smiley, my high school sweetheart, who was a newly commissioned officer from the United States Military Academy. Um, he was an officer. I was a nurse. My new last name was Smiley. It, it's like, it doesn't get, you know, very much more American dreamish than that. I mean, that, that was it. And, um, Shortly after we were married, he deployed to Iraq, Mosul, Iraq, for over a year-long deployment. Um, and that is when, you know, that was 2000, 2004, 2005, some of the heaviest fighting that we saw in Iraq during that time. Um, so it was a really, really hard deployment. We lost dear friends. Um, you know, I was home working as a nurse and then, you know, helping my, it is awful. Too many funerals, um, too many horrible phone calls. And on April 6th of 2005, that became a reality uh, for both Scotty and and I. Um, April 6th of 2005 changed everything. I was awoken out of bed by a phone call. Um, I was excited because Scotty would call at different times. You know, you never knew when they were going to call. Um, And I excitedly answered it before my nursing shift, but it was someone else's voice on the other end of the line that began to describe, you know, the most horrific news. I'll I'll never forget. He it's, it was Scotty's company commander. And he said, he just kept saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I was trying to process, what are you talking about? And and he finally said, one thing I know, Tiffany is is Scotty will never see again. He said he, he came face to face with this suicide car bomb and the shrapnel um, took out both of his eyes. He said, there's nothing there. Um, and he goes, the other thing we're not sure of is if he'll survive. Um, he said he flatlined several times. Oh. We've loaded him on a Black Hawk helicopter and hopefully someone calls you from Balad, Iraq. So that, that was the day that changed everything. That is the day that is the reason that I'm running for United States Senate today. Yeah. Um, you know, at 20, well, yeah, at 23 years journey. old, Right. And yes. The, so your your, yes. your story is is basically about from that moment until as far as you can go, trying to help Scotty beat the odds. That's right. And, and that's when you're. I think you're. It sounds to me from your story, your your full potential of public service and 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 working to help people sort of came to the forefront. Absolutely. You know, it's not the nursing career um, I thought I was going to have, but in many regards, I would say, thank God I was a nurse. You know, I walked into Scotty's trauma care unit at 23 years old. I had student loan debt. I had a car payment um, and I just resigned from my nursing job. I knew this was, this was going to be a lifelong, you know, challenge for us. I, I knew my, my career had to go on hold. Um, but thank God I was a nurse because I could navigate that system. You know, I'm a, I'm a educated, trained advocate. That's what nurses are best at. And um, Scotty didn't have a voice. You know, I walked into his room and he was, he was in a coma. He was paralyzed on the right side of his body and he had no eyes. Um, and the army was very swift and quick to begin his medical retirement. And I had a lot of questions. I, you know, was able to build a coalition and take on the army and and ask for a better way, ask for something better for our catastrophically injured veterans and their families. And ultimately, Scotty, you know, built a coalition that believed in this vision as well. And Scotty went on and became 
the first blind active duty officer to continue service to our country. Um, something that had, had never been done before. You know, in, in some regards, they looked at me like I was crazy. They're like, Mrs. Smiley, there has never been someone blind to continue service. Like, <laughs> sign the paperwork, give it up, you know? <laughs> right. You're not going to win the fight. <laughs> and here you are, tw- 23 years old, right? Like fresh off the farm, although you have a nursing degree. I'm sure they looked at you like, okay, that's sweet. I understand that you're disappointed, yes. but it is what yep. it is. And you just said, not not on my watch. That's right. That's right. Um, I was able to be a voice for Scotty um, when he didn't have one. And not only that, it sort of changed the trajectory of the Army and how they treated and looked at our catastrophically injured veterans and their families. And, you know, we served a whole another decade. So when people say, wow, you know, this is such a big jump getting into the Senate, Tiffany, like, whoa, you know, are you sure that you have the energy to take on Patty Murray? Um, I always say I moved eight times in 10 years with a blind husband and toddlers. So I'm pretty <laughs> sure I have the that energy is, to do this. That deserves a medal in and of itself. That, I can't even imagine that. <laughs> a lot of experiences. Let's just say that. That's incredible. So, I mean, look, this, this alone, right? If, if that alone was your life's accomplishment, it would have been far exceeding basically what anybody else has done. But you decide at some point to start kind of getting into politics. I mean, this is obviously your first run. When did you first sort of understand and, and, and feel like you could give something in this arena as well? Honestly, it was 17 years ago when I walked into Scotty's room and I realized, realized the fight that was ahead of us. Um, although politics wasn't on my mind at all, you know, during that time, I was just actively working to make a difference. It was the nurse in me, right? Like we have to make this right. We have to make this right. I'll do anything I can. Right. Um, and so I, I was always knocking on doors and advocating and going to Capitol Hill, any opportunity I had to share about ways that we could better, you know, serve our service members and their families. And really, you know, I would say when Scotty went to transition and retire as a senior major in the military and came up to the VA system, um, and I saw again, it was like, once again, it was like April 6, 2005, all over again, but now with the VA system. And, um, you know, Scotty was so frustrated. He said, Tiffany, I'm not even going to go through with this. I I just want to move on with my life. And I said, no, we have to take this fight on because there's thousands of others that are having to go through this as well. And perhaps they don't have a nurse by their side helping them. Um, So I took on the VA fight. And I think that's when it really started to change for me because I realized as you know, this was in my volunteer time. This was absolutely just doing what's right. I realized, wow, we so much. And if you can move the needle as as a volunteer, as an activist in this country, how much more could we do if we are, if, you know, if I'm elected, if I'm in the Senate, if I'm doing this as a job, you Mm -hmm. know, and looking at it from a holistic perspective of the policies and the people that you can work with to move the needle. And not only that, actually deliver results, deliver results for the end customer, whether that's the American people or our veterans, that's what our country needs. And I, I saw the insight side workings of that. And in some regard, we, we were successful. Um, I mean, there's still a lot of work to do. And I think that's what motivates me and motivates our family to continue this fight because, you know, Scotty and I, we want to know that in 10, 20 years that our three boys have a country that's worth losing their eyesight for. And if if I don't get into this fight, I, I don't know that we do. I, I know Patty Murray's certainly not leading us in that direction. Um, she's Russia. destroying Washington State. <laughs> no kidding. I mean, it, it, it's it's first of all, you're, you're sort of a perfect candidate in a lot of regards, and that you genuinely care, which is why you're doing it, right? I mean, I'm sure you have got better things to do with your time than than go out and have everybody tell you why it is that you can't win. But now that you're in this, you, you've got you widen the aperture to face not only the issues that you've dealt with so heroically over the last 17 years, but now you're dealing with everything from inflation and, and the economy to immigration to, I mean, you name it. And we still have, you know, huge concerns and with our armed services and veterans and everything else, it, what is that like then transitioning from this, this fight that you've been in to all of a sudden, meeting with and talking with voters who have their own fights on their hands? 
well, you know, I, I really believe we've been so successful in this campaign because I can relate to people. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've been in the trenches that they've been in. I've had, had to fight hard battles. You know, I built a business from the ground up. That was an incredible resource uh, for our family. And we felt the effects when we were shut down and during COVID. And, you know, I'm, I can relate to people in a really real way. And that's what people are looking to, especially in this cycle is, you know, Patty Murray is completely out of touch. You know, has she ever run a business? Has she ever really, you know, certainly didn't serve our country in in public service. Sure. If you want to call it that, but where's her connection with the people? You know, she went on the Senate floor in June of 2020 and asked for police funds to be diverted um, away, away from our police force. I mean, our city is being destroyed. We're understaffed in our policing in Seattle. We have the most cars stolen on record. I mean, this isn't just Seattle, this is all across Washington. So when I get out and I'm talking with people, they're looking at me and they're like, I I trust you. Like you actually care. Um, You've been where I've been. And I want to have hope that I can get out of this. I want to have hope that there's a a better future ahead. And Patty Murray is just not delivering that for Washington. No question about it. I mean, you present such an incredible contrast with Patty. I don't know if there's anybody that's less relatable in the entire less relatable government than Patty Murray. I mean, she is sort of the dictionary definition of the establishment Democrat that has inspired nothing but just the yes. slide of, of America and, and Washington in particular. Look, she's presided over a whole bunch of jobs leaving the state. She's presided over rising crime, as you just said. Um, I have to imagine when you're looking at taking on a task this daunting that you're sort of doing the math as you're doing it and where you have to go get votes. But like the King County area is not just Seattle, right? I mean, there's like a lot of suburban votes there that I imagine you're finding an awful lot of people who are interested in you and your story. You are absolutely correct. And and I do want to make a note as well that this last November, um, Seattle elected a Republican city attorney. Yeah. So, so that alone shows something is shifting. And I certainly, you know, I'm screaming it from the mountaintops that I know something is shifting. Um, but it was interesting after my first quarter of fundraising, of course, my my made most of my donations came from my Benton Franklin County area. And second was King County. Mm. Yeah, uh, I believe it. I believe it. So I mean, it look, that's yes. a that's a demographic there of people who you know, they're higher educated, higher income, uh, suburban type folks, but they're also no up from down when it comes to things like the economy. Right. And, and what these folks are doing, what Patty Murray is sort of blindly leading people into is a disaster for folks like that. Yes. And, and they're seeing it every day. You know, I always say our, our family certainly felt the pains of bad policy, but what a great country that we have that we can, you know, advocate and and change it and make it better for others. But people in Washington state today are opening their door and experiencing bad policy every single day. You know, the American people shouldn't have to do that when they wake up in the morning is feel the pain of bad policy. They should feel the freedom of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, And, and that's what I'm fighting for, for Washington families. Um, I like it a lot. You know, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. The, the the state is interesting, right? Because it's what I always described it. It was like Berkeley and then Idaho, right? And and you're like <laughs> from the Idaho part. I imagine when you get out to Spokane and you're out around the western or the eastern part of the state, you're you're greeted with a hero's welcome. Oh yes, and, and honestly, those are my people. But I always tell them, um, I say, I-, I need you. You're key. And when I come back, I want you to have five or ten more people with you. Yes. Um, and what's awesome yes. is, you know, I've done a full circuit of of all counties. I've been in in all three nine counties multiple times. Um, but it's awesome. The second round, there's more and more and more people. They are my people. Um, and, and they're energized. I need, I need that their intensity. I need them to get, you know, their neighbors and their friends to come out and vote. And, and that's what we're focused on, on the, the Eastern side of the state. And not only that, I have an incredible husband he, who champions me. He was actually the one kicking me out the door saying, Tiffany, you're the fighter. If there's anyone to beat Patty Murray, it's you. You have to go do this. Um, and he's just an incredible surrogate for me. 
I, yeah. I mean, who, who's going to tell the body, no, I'm not going to get off my couch and vote. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Right. Well, it's quite a love story that you have there. And it's quite a story that you have all the way that's led you to this point. Um, so where do things stand? Are you, are you sort of, when you look at the end of April, 2022, the trajectory that you're on, are you going to get this done? We're going to get this done. Um, we couldn't be in a better position. And, um, you know, I growing up playing sports, I, I use those analogies and a lot of, you know, team building and, and everything that I do. And we're on offense. We're, we're in a really, really great position. Um, we, we have the grassroots movement behind us. Um, you know, I've earned the endorsement of many of the county parties and the state party came out in August and endorsed me and got behind me, something that they haven't done in decades, if ever. Um, so there's, you know, I've been able to keep the path clear, which is new for Washington. It's like, we have to do something different here to get a different result. So we've been able to keep the path clear. I've raised $4.5 million. That's what we're at right now. Um, a lot more to raise, of course, but but it's a good place to be. I out fundraised Patty Murray last quarter. Yeah, um, so we are. Yes. And in January, Crosscut Elway poll, which is sort of the gold standard here in Washington, had Patty Murray at 42, generic Republican at 39. Wow. It's only three points. Um, And then, of course, I'm sure you saw the the crystal ball moved the rating um, in this state to likely I anticipate that will continue to move. We're, you know, in February, I started doing volunteer trainings in Snohomish, Pierce and King County. So I already have folks out there on the ground knocking doors, um, making phone calls. Um, RNC, NRSC has already dedicated field staff and setting up a victory operation. So we're in a really, really great place. But of course, it's pedal to the metal. I mean, the we're getting to, to game time now, you know, we've sort of been training, practicing, hitting all of our marks and, and now we're getting into game time, but we're in a really, really good position. I'm excited. Yeah. I am really excited because I have great hope for this state. This is an incredible state. Um, we're just underrepresented. Yeah, We no should be question. leading the country in a lot of areas. I, I, so, so look, I want to get to the three questions, but I, I think what I've always said about a campaign, particularly one that's not expected to be close and becomes that quickly, is that you can always tell the momentum yeah. of who looks like they're having fun, right? Patty Murray is <laughs> physically incapable of looking like she's having fun. And you present probably the biggest contrast I've ever seen between two candidates in that regard. So I think you got something going here. Yeah. And, you know, I have a great team. I have to say, I, I'm not doing this alone. I have an incredible team that's behind me, that's committed, that's loyal to this mission. Um, and I think that's key as well. No question about it. All right. I got three questions for you. And for a farm girl, I'm, I'm actually very interested in, in number one. Um, first question is, if you could plan your last meal on earth, what would it be? So this is hard for me. Um, God, for every farm girl, it's a hard question. That's why I was interested in it. Probably want me to say a steak, <laughs> which when I got busted into the city school, I did. I had to teach my friends, you know, that a steer is different than a bull, and the steak that you eat is from a steer. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to go into that. But <laughs> Thanks. Um, I would say. <laughs> Washington State has, and I, uh, this is one of my favorite foods, and Washington State has some of the best oysters in the country. Oh, no And, you know, I think there's a limited amount of oysters, I think, that you're supposed to eat before you get to toxicity. So my last meal would be as many oysters as I can eat. I grill them. I make a really good oysters, Rockefeller. Um, South Bend is the oyster capital of the world right here in Washington State. And Jose cooks on this grill outside. I've been there. It was the best oyster. I would invite him over. I'd have um, Taylor fish, uh, shellfish come over, Hama Hama oysters come over, and we'd do a big oyster cookout. And, and I would eat as many oysters. Yeah, um, toxicity as I could. That's it, it matters not, right? Because it's the last That's one. Right. That's right. <laughs> I love that. That's a really good answer. All right. So here's a, another interesting question for you who's dedicated so much of your adult life to, to fighting one mission. Um, if you'd ever, if that never happened, if that never sort of was a part of your life and you had this big 
sort of open hole of blue sky that you can pick whatever it is that you wanted to do with your life, what would that be? You know, it, I always say if I, if, if I lived another life, I think I would be a cowgirl. Um, I think I'd be a, yeah. Well, that's I, I what really, your dad wanted, right? That's what your dad <laughs> wanted. I always wondered, you know, could I be that girl who, you know, the NFR world champion bull r- or barrel racer? Um, I, I, with the big belt buckle, you know, walking around, um, there's you freedom could, on a horse. Bring that to, yeah. You could bring that to like international stardom, Tiffany, that, that if you would have gone that route, that would have been a bigger deal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And a lot of fun too. Yeah. All right. All right. So here's the third question. And you got to follow me on this one because it's a little difficult to explain. Uh, The way we see it, everybody's motivated by one of two things, the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat. And the thrill of victory people are kind of the sunny optimists aren't always charging up the hill towards an accomplishment. They're just sort of optimistic people. The agony of defeat people are people whose every setback that they've ever had in life is what drives them. Their every accomplishment, it lasts like two seconds and they're just on to the next. But the, the problems that they've had, they just carry like a backpack throughout their entire life, bowing never to repeat it or to change or, or to do whatever. And that's what drives them. Where do you find yourself? Agony of defeat drives me. I can see that. Completely. I mean, yeah. I, I, yeah, even asked that seems I could have guessed that before you even came on just really? reading your story. I could have guessed. Well, you know, we've done like 150 of these, right? So I kind of get a good psychoanalysis <laughs> of like of everybody we have on. You got it, yeah. <laughs> as smile, as smiley, which you are, uh, and optimistic as you are, you seem very much like an agony of defeat person. Yes, absolutely. Fail- failure is not an option, and um, it it drives me. It, it pushes me. Yeah. Um, to be the best, to always, always be better. And, um, you know, it's, I, I think failures propel us to greatness. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly that's been my life story, not the story I probably would have written, um, but was made for it. Yeah, absolutely. So Tiffany, tell us and all of our listeners where we can go to help you out. Yes. Join us at smileyforwashington.com. All spelled out. You can sign up. You can, you know, learn about what we're doing. This could very well be the seat that flips the Senate this cycle. Um, Nothing is impossible. And um, I I know the power of coming together, building coalitions and working with others. So come join us, smileyforwashington.com. That's awesome. Listen, this is one of the real feel good stories of the year in politics. Tiffany Smiley, we're going to be following you throughout if you find yourself in Washington, D.C. for meetings or whatever, we'd love to have you in studio and follow awesome. up and see how your race is going. I would love that. I will let you know for sure. Thank you so much for you having bet. me on. Take care.